the world. But I'm connecting with a, a lot of good friends, a lot of good old mates, old parts of the of the world that I haven't been to for many years, and I feel this drive to get there. And that gives me an opportunity to see people that are very special in my professional and private life. And that's where Emmanuel comes in. Emmanuel, welcome. How are you? Hey, Paul. How are you? I'm doing great. We're, we're really getting places now. It's really happening. <laughs> this is amazing. I'm so privileged to be here with you today, Paul. It's a well, great we'd be delighted if you could come. Wow. Yeah. Amazing great. speakers. Wow. Great. That many people all, and so many different scientific disciplines and regions and stories and approaches. It's been so much energy. When we, uh, about a week ago, Emmanuel, we were, we were wondering what are we doing? We've created some sort of monster that can't be ridden, you know. But once we press the go button, then it's just running and uh, the energy is just terrific and uh, really feel that we're making progress. Well, I just want to inter introduce you, Emmanuel. Emmanuel Gonzalez, he's going to speak about a rise up for the ocean, a, a blue call to action. Emmanuel is a professor in Portugal's chief scientist on, and on the board for the Oceano Azul Foundation, who are partners of ours at Pristine Seas National Geographic. We've, we've had some terrific expeditions together, um, and thanks to Emmanuel and his team, I've been back to Portugal many times at conferences, and whether it's high-level conferences on, 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 on the planet or, or more detailed conferences on plastic waste, you name it, uh, Emmanuel says something and I jump and go to Portugal any opportunity. <laughs> it's great to see you, Emmanuel. Well, I'm sorry we're not somewhere more exciting, like on a dive boat together. Great to see you, Paul, and I'm pretty sure that will come soon, for sure. I, I mean, we are we are bound to be together in the ocean, uh, saving it and uh, exploring it, for sure. Yes, please. All right, well, we haven't got a huge amount of time, Emmanuel, so I'm going to jump off and, and, and leave you with people from 82 different countries. <laughs> Have a lot of fun. See you next few minutes. <clears throat> so let me start by showing a, a small video about this initiative. So a bit of background on this campaign. Um, we have the science showing us clearly that we are currently facing two existential issues. We are facing a climate emergency and a species extinction crisis. And truly from 2018 to now, this United Nations report have uh, clearly explained us that we are in a situation as we've never been before. We know that we have a climate emergency that is a triple threat to the ocean because the ocean, the ocean is warming. It absorbs more than 90% of the excess heat that the CO2 in the atmosphere is producing. The ocean is also becoming more acidified because it's absorbing a quarter of the CO2 
that we are putting out in the atmosphere. And we have also recently um, understood that the ocean is becoming with less oxygen. And um, if you still doubt where we are, these graphs clearly show us the picture. From the last century on, the last decade was the warmest on record ever. The years 2016, 19, and 20 were the warmest on record, and the 10 warmest years have occurred since 2005. We also understand why the ocean is becoming acidified, because the CO2, when enters the water, it, um, links to the water, produces carbonic acid. This carbonic acid releases uh, hydrogen ions, and these, in turn, decrease the pH. And this is a real issue for marine organisms, because for millions of years, the pH in the ocean has been quite stable. We also are understanding now that we have hundreds of zones around the world that are becoming uh, hypoxic zones with loud oxygen or very few oxygen. And even in the open ocean in some areas, we know that the big fish, such as billfishes, tunas that have a high metabolism, are not being able to dive deep enough to capture prey because there's not enough oxygen. On the species extinction crisis on the ocean, we have also, also recently realized that this is a global problem. Only 13% of the ocean is seen to be intact, and science shows us an, an intact ocean is an ocean that has very few human impacts and has the, all the components of the marine biodiversity around. But actually, this seminar study by Ben Alpern and their uh, colleagues in 2008 has painted the picture of the global ocean as already having high to very high impacts of human activities. And so for some of the components of the ocean, what we have in the ocean today is about 10% of what used to be there before we start extracting, for instance, the big predators, which is what we are showing here. So truly, we now have the knowledge. We know. We know what we have done. And we also have the solutions. We also know what we need to do. We need urgently to save what's left, because as we saw, there's not much of the ocean left. But that's not enough because we need, if we just have what's left, we're going to save just a very small portion of the biodiversity. We need truly to rebuild the uh, communities in the ocean, to rebuild nature, and we have the solutions for, there, for that. And finally, we have to rethink our way. We have to rethink the way that we have been using the ocean to make sure that we'll make all the ocean activities sustainable. To save what's left, what's left we have the tools. Marine protected areas work. And although we know that they work, we have just protected uh, a very small percentage of the ocean, 7% with some types of protection, but only less than 2% with fully protected <clears throat> uh, marine protected areas, which are the ones that we know that produce the best results. When we fully protect the ocean, we'll have larger fish, we'll have more fish, we'll have more species. And of course, these species and these fish will not stay inside these protected areas and they will replenish the ocean, they will, they will replenish the fisheries. And so what we need is to upscale these solutions that we have and we need to do it now. So we know that we have this campaign for 30% of the ocean to be protected by 2030 and we know also in which of the areas of the ocean we should put the uh, pressure to build these marine protected, protected areas. But when we talk about protecting the ocean, what are we truly talking about? Uh, we are talking about protecting these animals. We are talking about protecting these creatures of the oceans that we are so fortunate to be able to see when we dive throughout the world. And I'm going to show you a few of these um, examples of these creatures. And um, on the lower right side of the images, you'll have the names, the common names of these animals. And so here we have a lionfish, a seahorse just photographed near Lisbon, a scorpion fish in the Azores. Um, this um, parrotfish, this school of parrotfish in the Maldives, this batfish in Indonesia, um, this hawkfish that live among the corals, um, and uh, many other creatures such as this lizardfish in Komodo, catfish. So this is what we talk about when we protect ocean, the frogfish, that are amazing creatures and these tiger sharks. But if, if you have 
listen carefully to the names of these animals, and I'm going to state them again. Lion, horse, scorpion, parrot, bat, hawk, lizard, cat, frog, and tiger. We realize that what we do is that we bring what is, what is familiar to us on Earth, on the land, and we put the names of the animals in the ocean as um, they were these land animals that we are more familiar with. And so we have this disconnect between the ocean animals and the uh, humans. And if you don't uh, believe me, I'll show you some more. These sea slugs that um, are truly the butterflies of the ocean. They have these amazing forms, these amazing colors. They are all over um, the world, uh, a, a, pref uh, a favorite for divers. But even here we have a sea cow, again, a land animal. And it's not just animals. Some few more examples, the antlers, sponges, these uh, sea porks, um, these uh, orangutan crabs, um, or the sea lions. Again, our common names from land creatures. But we also use, for instance, objects that humans are uh, currently knowing about, jewels, fans, sea fan, the pipe fish, um, this uh, feather duster worm, the jellyfish, and, um, you know, animals, beautiful animals set that, as, as cup corals, hammerhead sharks, porcelain crabs, or um, these people crabs. And again, all these familiar names as the bobtail squid that we import to the ocean to name the sea creatures there. And even some of our things like, you know, a surgeon fish or hermit crab. So other common names that we use in land, harlequin shrimp, the ghost pipe fish, or the surgeon fish, um, the pygmy seahorse, because they are so tiny and they live in these corals, the soldier fish, the clownfish, of course, which are a must also for divers, or this uh, school of jack, the Napoleon wrasse. Um, and it's easy to understand why do we anthropomorphize animals and sea creatures when we are in the water with animals such as these dolphins in Egypt or these sperm whales in the Azores. Um, and also sometimes we also bring our fantasy, such as in the case of this Pikachu um, nudibranch in uh, Bali, Indonesia. But truly, this is what we're trying to do. We're trying not to lose all these species, all these animals. Uh, and at the same time, we know that we have to find solutions to this crisis. And this is where Rise Up uh, comes in. This is where Rise Up is this uh, global initiative uh, built, which built an agenda around these six letters. And I'm, I'm going very briefly just to show you and drive you through those. So this is an agenda that uh, is directly to governments, directly to businesses, to put out a truly bold um, transformation of the way that we use the, the ocean. The Ocean Azul Foundation has partnered with Ocean Unite, the Oak Foundation, and many others, large um, philanthropic organizations, NGOs, but also fisher folk organizations, indigenous peoples organizations, and more than 500 um, institutions and organizations are now behind this agenda that really tries to bring this transformational, ch transformational change that we need. So the letter R is to restore ocean life. And there are a number of priority actions identified. I would like to highlight this one, which is we need to protect the livelihoods of coastal people. And the way to do this is to prioritize access in territorial seas to those small scale fishers and to push out the industrial fishing that um, it's uh, arguable if they have a place in the ocean, that just uh, destroy the livelihoods of these um, coastal communities. We have the letter I to invest in a net zero, net zero carbon emissions future, and this is directed for climate change transformation. And in the ocean, of course, it's very important, not only in the ocean, also in land, but if you are to face this challenge, we need to ban all new offshore oil and gas exploration, and we have to phase out the ones that currently exist rapidly so that we can stop putting carbon in the atmosphere as we are doing today. The letter S is to speed the transition to a circular and sustainable economy. And here I would like to highlight, and we have heard today about the Desgupta report, that it is essential 
that we incorporate the ocean value in economic decision making. And for this to happen, we need to um, make sure that the natural capital and also the social capital are included in the cost benefit analysis. And of course, we also need to stop destroying the ocean further, such as uh, using uh, activities such as seabed mining. Letter E is to empower and support coastal people. And it's fundamental to give coastal people and uh, indigenous people the way to recognize their rights, to secure their rights for marine resources, because by this, we will also bring resilience, social resilience and economic resilience. Letter U is unite for a global govern ocean governance. And here I would highlight this idea of having a States of Head conference that will look at all these actions of the Blue Coal and will make sure that they are implementable and they are implementable now. And finally, letter P, protect at least 30% of the ocean by 2030. I would like to highlight two of these actions. One is the 30 by 30 adoption of the Convention on Biological Diversity that we are, are looking forward um, later in the year in, in China, and also to accelerate progress in implementing this 30% of protection of the global ocean by 2030. So what this um, agenda is bringing is a new way to look at the ocean, pulling all these pieces together for a global agenda where we can try to uh, bring the solutions to solve these ex existential crises. And these four transformational actions that uh, are here are, we believe, um, essential ways to bring forward to governments and decision makers now. And the first one is an obvious one. We have lots of policies, we have lots of legal frameworks, but we keep procrastinating decision making on ocean governance. And we need to stop doing that. We need to implement what we already have. But we also know that that's not enough. And so we need to move forward with this idea of a global ocean pact. And the rise up for the ocean agenda could be a strong basis for such a pact. And finally, these two other, um, um, these two other actions, we firmly believe that could be really transform transformational. And the first one is that we really need to invert the burden of proof of marine conservation. What we do today is that we close areas and we fight everywhere else to stop destroying nature. And we have to reinvert this process. We have to assume that the ocean needs to be protected. And then when we open certain activities in certain areas, in certain ways, we need to make sure that those activities are sustainable and are, do and are doing in a sustainable way. And finally, this uh, fourth action, um, which is an obvious one as well in our point of view, is that the high seas should be seen as the common heritage of mankind. And so we need to stop destroying the high seas, to stop fishing there, to stop uh, now thinking about uh, mineral extraction, because it's not economically rational, it's not socially viable, and it's not environmentally sustainable. And so if we bring all these four transformational changes, we believe that we will have a way forward. Finally, I will direct you to the website riseupfortheocean.org. Any organization can come and sign to the Blue Call to Action. And we hope to bring this to the next UN Ocean Agenda, which will be in a beautiful Portugal, Lisbon, in July next year. Thank you very much. Wow. Emmanuel, that was just fantastic. Bravo. Thank you, buddy. Absolutely brilliant. I've always enjoyed your perspective. You have a great way of having a you know refreshing perspective on something. And I got a lot from that one. And obvious to you, but not to me, is the use of land words. What a great way of giving us all a fresh perspective on the ocean. It's amazing, isn't it, Paul? You know, I was pulling the slides together for this talk. And I was trying to find an angle where we could show that there is this disconnect between us humans and the ocean. And the reason for this disconnect uh, is one of the reasons why we are having such a big problem is that it's very difficult to explain and to show to the common citizen, so to say, that there is all this value underwater, all these beautiful animals, and we need to protect it, protect them. And, you know, it really struck me that we are using all these land references when we refer to the ocean, because actually we have this disconnect that we need to move forward and we need to try to solve. 
And um, I think it was a powerful way to try to transmit. Um, and I would look at more, more uh, uh, ocean animals now with a different angle in trying to find how do we name them, do we name them and, and, uh, and what are the bases for those names. But uh, yeah, it's a very, a very interesting, I would say, um, realization that uh, humans are actually tra translating what is familiar to us um, to, the, to the ocean. I think it's just great. You've, you've given me a, a you know, different perspective. And I can imagine us diving together next and finding our own alternative ocean-based names or something. <laughs> we, we have to do it, Paul. We have to find, to find names that are less familiar to humans so that we can bring all this imaginary also to people. I think it's brilliant. There's a lot of potential there. And for and I've just put the website up there, you know, Rise Up for the Ocean. It's it's a great initiative. I like the idea that people can join in and sign up. How much support do you have at the moment? Yeah, it, is, it has been amazing, Paul. You know, this, uh, this global initiative that uh, we are one of the partners has um, gathered more than 500 organizations throughout the world already. And we are actually picking up on this agenda and for each of the items of the agenda we are building a plan of action so the idea is that we will bring to the un ocean conference not just a request if you want of items but exactly how those actions could be uh, implemented could be implemented now so that we will um you know have hope that this transformational agenda could become a true ocean pact that we need in order for us to um, not only save the ocean, but uh, as Sylvia was saying back then, uh, to save ourselves, because this is what is at stake now. And, and you know, we have a very, very short window of time. So this year and next year are going to be critical years for the ocean. We have the CBD coming up, the Convention on Biological Diversity meeting. We have, of course, the UN Ocean Conference in Lisbon, which are going to be critical for us to make sure that um, you know we stop procrastinating and more than that we rally all these um forces together all these people together all these projects together and uh we make this an in inevitable agenda for us all at the global scale i think it's fantastic emmanuel it it couldn't be better because it's the right time and let's face it you know here we are with COVID-19 pandemic has all brought us you know sharply to focus that we need to look after nature better re readdress that balance. All of this great financial advice and um, presentations we've been receiving on global economies through the festival have been very rewarding for people like us, Emmanuel, because they're telling us that every single sample we make, every single data point we make, every photograph we take contributes to smart decision-making politically and global economies. So it's a, it's a really sweet spot. And it sounds as if your project is going to hand the decision to people on a plate, really. Yeah. Absolutely, Paul, you know, and, and science is key for all of these. Science is what shows us the problem, but science is also driving us the solutions. And so we need to com continue and we truly need to upscale science in the ocean, you know. We are in the decade of ocean science, but, you know, the, the, the budgets are still a fraction of what they need to be so that ocean exploration and ocean science can truly be the, 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 the backbone of this new bioeconomy that is coming our way where nature finally could be valued instead of destroyed. Fantastic. And you know, you had me as on your first image, Emmanuel, because it was our wave in the Salvagens. It was, it was for sure. <laughs> and, and so everybody knows Eman, Emmanuel and I were together in the Salvagens um, expedition a few years ago. And one of the things we did is we all fell in love with this particular wave. It was an, almost a standing wave that was up over a shallow seamount. And we fell in love with that wave. So that's when you, when you showed that image, I went, oh, yeah, I'm hooked. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was such an amazing expedition, Paul, and I just uh, hope that we can have many more. Oh, I can't wait. I can't wait to get back at sea with you, buddy. All we right. Well, look, thanks very much, everybody. There's the website to, to check on Emmanuel's great work, uh, riseupfortheocean.org. I'll see you very soon, Emmanuel, here in Geneva, there in Portugal, somewhere in the sea, somewhere, please. Let's do that, Paul. Thank you very much. Okay, buddy. Thank you very much. See you.